Okay, uh, good afternoon. I guess afternoon in Russian. I'm Alex, and today we're gonna have our module number three, our lecture number three, and it will be about analysis and classification of the microblogs. Mm -hmm. So I hope you enjoyed the previous two lectures and uh, feel free to reach us to ask any questions if you have any. Today lecture will be a continuation of lecture number two, but uh, today we'll be focused much more on the classification and also on the feature engineering when it comes to analysis of microblocks. Plus, we will be focusing on discussing the particular properties of the microblocks as compared to some other tradi traditional media sources you might have. So, buckle your bells and let's start. We'll be talking about microblocks, about analysis of microblocks, about classified microblocks, and it'll be some summary. There is an article by one of my uh, colleagues back in the US that you can read about. This is quite a fun read about the real-time uh, microblock analysis algorithms. So, blogging and microblogging. Uh, this is one of the most typical and one of the most um, huge concepts that has uh, emerged together with social media. Pretty much all of our uh, social media uh, world that we have is a blogs. Microblogs is a uh, blocks uh, where we have a limitation to the character and blocks are usually maintained by individuals or maybe by a community and uh, they are displayed in a reverse chronological order so everything that was recent it will be on the top and then the rest recent will be on the bottom so you can see the different blocks in wikipedia we even have a search engine for blocks you can browse it for you if you open the page, you can see there's really a multitude of blocks available. And I guess now this uh, page contains even more blocks inside there. So there are there of different types for different specific needs and uh, there's a really variety of them. Uh, so if you go for so-called block search engine.org, you can also uh, look for a search engine that index just blocks so you can really search for particular uh, mentions inside there etc etc so this is a, a special search engine that was created just to queries inside the user generated data inside the blocks so uh, singer altered blocks are usually quite creative they reflect their opinion uh, uh, portrays the individual voice and maybe they uh, talk about some collaboration, then enhance and uh, really um, invite for the collaboration. And uh, of course, at the same time, there's also group blogs where we have uh, some peer discussions, we can chat on different topics, and we have different authors inside there. So if you look for the influencers and bloggers on uh, internet, it's usually uh, individual blogs. And the group blocks could be about, uh, let's say, PK groups or Facebook groups. Could be about different forums that we can have. This is a group blocks. So we also have blocks on photography. We can have uh, different blocks, professional blocks on not making pictures, but on professional cameras. So their interests, uh, they are based on the interests. And I guess the key characteristics of the blocks would be that they are quite formative, they are filtered, they have moderators, they uh, at the same time have our advantage of social media because they are uh, usually timely and uh, reflect the overall world around us. Uh, micro blocks have influenced the world a lot. And uh, if you look uh, in, uh, in the history, you'll see that in 2007, it get very popular. And let's say in 2005, 2006, people were talking about maybe Google, Yahoo, Flickr, and before that, people were talking about everything as an internet. 
So Twitter was one of the first blogs that have really enhanced and popularized that. But then we also get a multitude of social networks that have um, eventually risen the popularity of the whole movement. And uh, that's why we have this module here. So uh, if you talk about microblogs, and Twitter, of course, is one of the most famous example of microblogs. You will see that uh, microblogs, particularly, uh, have uh, very specific properties, and these specific properties are usually related to the uh, size uh, of the of the blog content. Uh, they usually consist of nothing but short sentence fragments, so they are more like a little shouts from a people, and they are quite different from the from the traditional blocks that are very well moderated and usually pretty much a whole uh, piece of text. If you watch this video on the bottom in the slide, you can actually see the explanation and some YouTube video about microblogging. This is one of the early Twitter videos when they were featuring themselves. So uh, the microblogging sites uh, in includes Twitter and Tumblr, Jaiku, Edmond, and actually quite uh, many uh, even video microblogging sites. So you can say that TikTok, for example, can be considered as a video microblogging site because the size of the video they are also limited by the length. Therefore, it's also very ad hoc, and also it um, reflects all the key properties of the microblogging. So if you uh, talk about what is inside microblogs, it's usually something about the statuses, the current status of the user, uh, some posts. And by the way, I shared this very early interface with you so you can see how Twitter looked before, maybe the time when you didn't really use internet yet, so Twitter won't look like this. So it has a title, it has some posts, and changes of this post, and uh, this is pretty much like updates. So I think one of the biggest advantages that really reflects the changes of a human and also an environment. Uh, of course, we also have friends as a typical social network, and therefore it's not just um, content inside there, but also the social graph. It's one of the key attributes, another key attributes of social networks. If you look into number of monthly active users in Twitter in Q1 2017, it was 328. Now it's uh, way above 500 uh, uh, millions of active Twitter users and uh, the network is still growing. So why are they are popular? Because they uh, help the people network the social networks, right? They help them to, uh, to, to to block, to communicate, to share their opinions. And I guess uh, the key concept of social media is the sharing. So therefore, every uh, platform that help you to enhance this sharing, to enable you to share, automatically become popular, especially uh, around certain uh, demographics of the users. So. Uh, it have, uh, of course, uh, um, like uh, several links, link structure in a sense, right? So we, we can listen news, you can use uh, Twitter as an information source, you can search for information, like uh, uh, we have uh, friends connections and communication with people, we have private messages there. So it's pretty much offers the uh, whole set of uh, all the features that social networks usually offer, usually offer to the users. For research, uh, Twitter is invaluable because uh, Twitter still have very nice APIs that each one can access to get live Twitter data. And these APIs uh, are no longer available, let's say, for Facebook. You have to really apply and go through for the long application process to get your app approved for production level, but in Twitter it's still possible. So you can get quite rich uh, social media data multimodal social media data from Twitter. So for research is very useful. So of course uh, we can also uh, uh, use Twitter for daily communications. 
for conversations with other we can uh, add somebody so we can use the user mention you can share URLs we can comment on news and collaborate the collaborative nature is as I said before is one of the key social networks uh, properties uh, so uh, for characteristics if you go on the characteristics for microblog you will see that they are real time and therefore they uh, provide a very strong signals of what's going on in particular region, particular country, or around particular topic. They are less informative. They more like give you a signal that something is going on than really tell you what's going on. And they are, of course, unstructured. A structured data is a characteristic of uh, any social network. So it's user-generated content, it's unstructured content. And of course, uh, Twitter is not an exception from this rule. So if you look in the blogs at the same time, uh, blogs are very informative. They have details, they are very well uh, filtered and discussed. They're well structured, they're timely. So they get the listed information and uh, they might not have some social activity because this is pretty much close already to a traditional media just in electronic format. So before we proceed into analysis of microblog text, let's yeah, right. have a quick break to wait for a few more people who might want to join. Three minutes break. Сколько ты будешь заряжать? Ну где тесты? Я люблю тесты, проходи. So, if you want to analyze microblocks, because we're all here to analyze, right? We're all here to figure out how uh, the social media data can be analyzed. So if you want to analyze microblogs, there are key aspects and considerations we will need to take into account. And one of course will be a lens, as I said before, because we cannot have a long text. It just doubled to 280 uh, characters, but then it was returned back to 140 in Twitter. Uh, we will have to handle informal and formal communication and in microblogs the communication is mostly informal. And therefore, we will have to have a special lexicons that can map this informal communication 
into a particular words, uh, the dictionary words that we can really use to understand the semantics of the content. Of course, uh, we'll have to look into uh, conversational aspects of the uh, macro blocks. So tweets are conversational and therefore they are often incomplete. They might not have a complete uh, context in each side of that and then change dynamically and documents are much more standalone. So to figure out what is the structure of the tweets or what the structure of combination of tweets, you need to move put more efforts as compared to the traditional documents. Uh, we uh, have a dynamic user community. People follow each other, unfollow each other. We have uh, different topics that they discuss and uh, people can uh, join and stop using, let's say, Twitter quite fast. So we kind of need to make sure that we can handle this structure. Live data streams are the key. And uh, in fact, you need to have a real-time processing algorithms for all social media networks to be able to really uh, comprehensively handle uh, all uh, this set of information and to be really able to deliver information on time and uh, make sure that we are really our machine learning models are really uh, handling the recent uh, evolution of the content. So um, therefore, when we process the tweets, we need to do term, uh, term extraction. Uh, you remember that uh, uh, last time uh, we were discussing that uh, text can be split into words, but let's say if we have a character language like Chinese, Japanese, or Thai, uh, we will also have to uh, segment the key keywords into the groups. But that, therefore, so we can uh, know what are the actually words and what are not words. Mm, so this is another independent machine learning task, uh, Chinese character segmentation. Uh, we will have to remove stop words. We'll have to normalize the vocabulary and um, we'll have to uh, represent the uh, terms uh, in, in a vector. So this is important aspect of how it works. So we also have to remove the stop words and uh, stop words, as you remember, are those words that are very commonly used and then they're not very useful for uh, national language processing because they don't help to distinguish one uh, entity from another and therefore they're not very useful. So we have to remove them. And there's no a list of stop words that is used for everything. And uh, I will tell you more for uh, social media, we want to have a uh, different list of stop words as compared to traditional literature text, let's say if you are using that. And this is again, conversational nature, the slang and many, many other things that are very common to Twitter, the lexicon common to Twitter. And uh, to handle this lexicon, we have to uh, have a special stop word list. Um, some, in some cases, we even don't remove them because we believe that if you remove wrong words from the tweets, you might lose the meaning and you rather keep all words and walk the text straight rather than remove the stop words in a normal, traditional way. There is a, a list of uh, Twitter and social media analytics stop words. And those stop words are adapted for social networks. So you're welcome to learn and use them in your systems. You can find it in a link in front of you. And uh, if you just try the Python uh, or any, any other language code, actually removing stop words is always uh, a basic operation that is available in uh, the machine learning libraries or national language processing libraries. And one of uh, uh, quite quite common stop words list is uh, an LTK stop word list. So just for the word back to uh, segmentation, you can see in this code we go through the sentence and we split sentence into words. But uh, in case if it's a, let's say Chinese uh, language, we will have to do the segmentation through another machine learning algorithm or rule based. We cannot just split it based on the um, on, this, uh, on the um, spaces and just use it, right? So uh, make sure that you really know how to work with the language you choose to run your uh, data analytics. So uh, we will have to do vocabulary normalization and uh, one of them is stemming. Uh, so as I remember uh, in the previous lectures, we were discussing that. So uh, we also have a lot of informal expressions that need to be translated back so you can see a few examples in front of you. 
Um, it can be slang, it can be a certain repetitive word removal, and all this has to be handled properly in order to do a good job on your data analytics. Uh, so you can see that we also can have typos, abbreviations, phonetics, substitutions, and many, many other things. If you use social media, you definitely know uh, many other things. And let's say one of them would be emoticons, right? Or even uh, stickers. They uh, bring a lot of information on what person feels and what person wants to say, but this is no longer text. It's pretty much visual data. Or it's a metadata to our uh, processing system that we need to consider. So um, to normalize vocabulary, we cannot really use steering because there's no regulations for this kind of complex and diverse uh, social media type of uh, writing and speech. So you probably would like to uh, detect some variants, some lexical variants, and then you want to normalize them based on the Twitter dictionary. So you would probably have some dictionaries that actually can help you to uh, normalize uh, your uh, words rather than uh, using the systemic, the straightforward approach. And then in this way, you'll get uh, high quality results. And those results will be readable and explainable. Um, there's a couple of resources. Uh, you can see one of them is called uh, uh, Social Media Normalization Lexicon. And you can try it in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the link in front of you. So it was crowdsourced. So it has more than 40 thousand uh, lexical variant normalization pairs. So therefore, so you can really do quite a good job or you can just query this directly from your platform through the API requests. So uh, we also can have the uh, vocabulary normalization. So basically we need to uh, make sure that we, we can go through the dictionary and change any occurrence of informal expressions back to the same form, right? It doesn't really matter what will be this form, but it's most important will be the same. So that when you'll be doing word counts, topic detection, etc., our bag of words will be balanced and will not be double counting uh, the same word. They'll be all put in the same bucket and you will have a much better understanding of the distribution of your features. And uh, of course, um, uh, we can also detect uh, last uh, uh, correct large population of formal expressions found within common streams. So basically, this means that uh, when we have many informal expressions meaning the same thing, we can count them as uh, one and, and accumulate the corresponding uh, bar of your distribution that you are uh, processing. So if you look at the whole pipeline of processing this, you'll see that you probably want to identify language first. And then based on the language that you have identified, you will be using the um, informal language normalization using corresponding uh, uh, dictionary to convert your informal language into formal language. Then you will be removing the irrelevant text and tokens filtering. So you'll be removing usernames, hashtags, related profiles, and alphabetical characters such as emoticons. Then eventually you'll be uh, discarding the tweets that are too short because Unlikely they will bring in too much information for, for your machine learning systems that you're gonna train and uh, run. So uh, now we have the text prepared and we want to really figure out how we want to classify our microblogging text. So we'll discuss this in the next section. And since today we have a little bit less material, let's have another break for three to five minutes.
And let's go a little bit further. So the classification of microblog text. Once we represented the text, we want to classify it. And there's a various applications where we can use microblog text classification to detect the topics, particular events, or even figure out what is this blog is all about. Or for example, uh, Peter itself uses uh, the classification of microblog text to discover the hector speech or some forbidden speech or content that they want to show to users and automatically red flag it before it gets even exposed to the audiences. So uh, you can use some basic classification approach and the simplest way of course would be just extract the weighted term vector where you just count the numbers of words for each of for this vector. And then you can train the classifier on training set and then for each tweet, you can do this analysis. You can detect the language, you can formalize the informal language just as we discussed just now. You can filter out the relevant text tokens and then you can use the resulting term vector uh, to uh, do the uh, final processing. So you'll have T1, T2, T N, and so on. Uh, so uh, you can use the weighted average uh, schema or uh, C, C square statistics statistics to uh, normalize the term vector to make sure that it's normalized. And then you can use uh, naive bias, KNN, SVM, classifier, neural network, random forest, boosting, backing, whatever you want to, to classify a new tweet uh, to belong to a particular category that you had in your training set. Uh, so this approach uses on text and uh, we believe that except for text, there could be many other uh, ways to improve the performance of the classification approach. So one way, uh, it could be uh, evolution, so the temporal aspect. How does the vocabulary evolve over time? You can use uh, location features, and also you can uh, look in the social graph and figure out what are the uh, relationship between people, what are the connections between them, and therefore so you can also gain some uh, meaningful and useful information that you can later use for your classification of microbial text. Uh, and what else? Think about it and uh, let us know during the tutorial. I think good ideas we will really appreciate. If you have a good ideas what else from microbials can be used to um, do a better job with the classifying microblocks into the, uh, into the categories from our training set. So additional uh, features uh, could be evolution text features, location information, social relationships, and uh, uh, tweeting tendencies over time. So it's not the evolution of the content, but it's rather the uh, sequences of when the tweet was posted and for what, etc., etc. So how to handle evolution of the text? There are two approaches. The first one is uh, you can uh, continually train classifier based on that set of features. And you can also, in other ways, assign a lower base to the text terms that are not used recently, right? So basically, if something was not used, you will uh, not uh, apply high weights on those terms and then they will play a smaller role in the overall prediction performance. So if you have a timeline and you have a beginning of the timeline and the end of the timeline is T start and T end, you can actually have uh, uh, some uh, internal intervals that you can use to split and dynamically train your content, um, your classifier based on the content. So the key idea here is then you can train the classifier features extracted from uh, the uh, initial window, IW, but you also can use some latest window in the end that will help you to uh, handle evolution and really make your classifier to be adaptive to the latest changes inside the tweets. So uh, IW, uh, the initial window, will ensure the stability of the vocabulary and will avoid the topic drift, but at the same time, uh, you'll be uh, also always using the latest set of vocabulary, so be able to uh, evolve together with, uh, with the uh, content that you're trying to classify. So, of course, we'll need to decide when we want to uh, update IW and DWs, so all those windows. 
and they also need to decide on the size. And we believe when you want to make this kind of decision, you uh, would probably uh, focus on different intervals, and we will really can see the channel, how often people uh, in each channel post, uh, how often updates, how often the trends change, and you could even go further and look at it at an individual level. So every individual probably have different posting, um, posting patterns, and therefore they might need to have different evolution videos as compared to uh, how you would be doing it for uh, the same, uh, for, 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 for everybody holistically in the same way. So it's going to be even personalized. So um, then after that, you can actually weight the features based on the temporality, based on how far the words are. So um, for example, lexical and synthetic features uh, have uh, been quite important traditionally for text processing. And uh, if you want to uh, you, uh, really continue the recent terms, you probably want to weight them higher as compared to the more old terms or those terms that no longer appear. So you can come up with a, a equation something like this, uh, where uh, the theta is some decay factor, and then you have uh, differences of the time inside there, and then you can normalize it. And WI is the term frequency of the uh, TI. So it's basically a modification of term frequency metric, uh, CI, that uh, considers the evolution of the term and the different times. And that really helps you to handle this kind of modifications and uh, fluctuations. Uh, so the word feature set uh, used at time t would be uh, computed as uh, the tuples, the, 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 the list of couples where you will get the weight of the term and the ci, which will be this uh, governing feature. And this vector can be called fc. So um, except for this uh, type of data representation, you can also use the uh, location features. Yeah. So for example, uh, if you take the word it more, you will see that it more can be many different things. It's not necessarily university it more, right? Of course, the first one is university, but in many other ways. So how to distinguish one it more from another it more? Like it's not that's not interstate theft measure offenders, but it's actually information technologies, mechanics and optics, university, right? University VI. So you can use a location. You can see where this has been posted, and uh, you can even uh, figure out the location from the text itself. So and studies show that location played a really huge role in detecting tweets. So uh, location helps you to predict whether a person is single or married, for example, with 80% accuracy. But it also, given it more example, it uh, can tell you that a tweet contains a chronic for the uh, St. Petersburg will, uh, will much more likely give likelihood that, that it's about location, university is more. Uh, but uh, when a tweet was, came, let's say, came from Italy, then it would probably mean that this Italian trails in medical oncology. Uh, it for center, right? So, so this is this is how you can differentiate them based on the uh, based on the location that you can infer, and uh, uh, you can find location in different places. You can find them from user profiles. This one is a given and easy way to find. So, some profiles put a time zone, or pe uh, people can put a valid geolocation the city level inside their Twitter profile. But also at the same time, about three percent of tweets have uh, geolocation, or they can put geotag in one of their uh, posts and tweets. And then finally, you can also get the geolocation from a text itself. And uh, we can get it with about 70% accuracy, so it's very really useful. It's again a separate topic of detecting location from the text of the message. Then with this kind of location in mind, you can do a much better job, because you can compare the location difference, the time difference, and geotag difference. Uh, let's say where location geotag tweets is uh, uh, it's far from a particular directed topic, and if it's, it is, then probably this text cannot be classified as a topic, and if they're near, then the probability of classification for this topic will be higher. So one of the last things you can use, of course, is a social relationship graph. Because we are dealing with social networks, we have explicit relationships defined between people. But we also have implicit relationship when people 
co uh, follow each other or interested in the same topic. So implicit relationship uh, basically is a lot of different actions that we are not directly interacting with other people, but at the same time, we're still through this action related to them. So you can see people can follow each other, you can uh, retweet each other's post. And then there can be many different uh, relationships with such a multi-modal graph consisting of uh, circles as the users and also the tweets with um, our triangles. So uh, tweet relevance can be from some social relationship with people. So relevant users uh, can be those who posted at least one relevant tweet on the topic and uh, relevant tweet can be a tweet that belongs to the topic. So, so you can actually compute the social feature, FS1, that uh, interacts uh, from a relevant tweet or interact from the relevant tweet. So basically you can see whether this tweet uh, gets uh, interacted with the relevant or with the relevant tweet and if two tweets belong to similar topics and maybe the third one, like K-nearest neighbors will be also the same topic, so it's a very useful feature. But also whether the author of the tweet follow relevant user or irrelevant user. Let's say we are talking about politics and we are thinking about politics if the guy also follows, uh, let's say, um, uh, CNN, then that would mean that it's more likely that this feature reflects this guy uh, interested in politics and the topic tweet is about politics. For example, uh, so these relationships uh, can be considered. And for example, of it more uh, has five Twitter accounts, and this account of relevant tweets and relevant groups. So based on uh, our studies, about eighty percent of users related to known accounts within two other accounts away from relevant known accounts can also be, uh, and this information can also be used. So basically, it says uh, if uh, uh, I'm uh, known relevant account and uh, pretty much two more uh, another relevant account related to my account are likely to be also relevant 80 percent chance likely and based on these known accounts we can create the new features so which is consists of distance to relevant account if somebody commented or referred to relevant account and also the same metrics to relevant accounts so basically this is a social graph incorporation how far the tweet authors uh, to each other, and that will mean that these guys are really also related to a particular topic or not. So, tweeting tendencies over time also help. And uh, uh, we propose to analyze tweets uh, to uh, determine the current relevance tweets. So, if you see the first uh, post is about NUS Medical School, National University of Singapore Medical School. And the person wants to join NUS. And then the second one is also about NUS professors that they travel to another country to give uh, uh, lectures and participate in breast cancer research. But in the third tweet, those actually didn't mention NUS, but you can infer that it's also about NUS from the first two tweets. And this is useful. If you just have your third tweet, uh, you will not be able to infer that it's from NUS. And therefore, tweets uh, probably need to be handled together so that you can really consider the whole timeline and really do a better inference rather than just on one tweet or one message. I think this is one of the key uh, areas that we need to consider. You don't want to work with individual tweets, you probably want to combine them on a user level to do better prediction on trends or some profile of the user. So uh, empirically, you can also observe that um, about 70 to 80% of tweets don't contain references to organizations, so it doesn't help to get it from a content. And about 70 to 29 percent of users in Twitter and also Chinese version Weibo, uh, respectively, make more than one tweet about the same event within the same day. And this can be used, right? You can basically measure the importance of event within one timeline or in a group of people to figure out how important this event is and use it as a trigger and as a uh, signal. So you can compute so called re immediate relevancy. Uh, which is about whether the last tweet by the same user within the same time uh, has been relevant. And if you find that one tweet was relevant, then another similar tweet is, is likely to be also relevant, and therefore you can infer and use it as a feature for your predictions. And of course, the relevant thread, whether the majority of tweets by, by a user in a time span is relevant. So this is like a score of the user. But also you can see the span across a group of people, 
to see what events are trending. We'll be discussing about this in the future lectures. And you can use a classifier, let's say SVM, or let's say some other classifier you like, let's say neural network, mm -hmm. to uh, use this static training window and also the only training window, combine them together, uh, do the feature extraction, and classify, uh, uh, learn the classifier, and then for the new bunch of data, the old data plus new piece of data, you can actually classify the query events into a particular type and a particular uh, category of documents. You can see that given the uh, StarHub uh, data sets from Singapore, where there are three organizations, StarHub, DBS, and NUS, you will be able to achieve a much better result in terms of precision recall and F1 measure when you were classifying based on the combined features, the features we did, all the features we discussed before. And just firm frequency can give much lesser precise results. So this shows that all these features are very relevant and for your lab works, I really recommend you to use these features in your assignments of the lab one plus two, uh, implement these features and really see how it works and it could be really helpful for you to uh, gain a better results of the prediction. So if you analyze and conclude, we would probably want to say that uh, features are important and just text feature is not very effective alone, at least for this data set. Location feature is important for something that related to different uh, parts of the region. But uh, in case, uh, like let's say in US have different places in the world, it might also have different locations in the world. But when uh, the, um, uh, the entities belong to the same country, the same cities, and location feature become less useful because anyway, they, they, they are similar location and you have to find other ways to differentiate them. So now, how can you, uh, basically they don't have the same names, right? Same as like it more have many same names, but here it doesn't. And therefore you have to use other features. Social relations feature is quite useful and uh, incorporating all produce uh, much better results. And usually this is the case. So you want to incorporate multimodal information to do a much better job in your prediction as compared to a single model, single type of data representation. So uh, in this uh, uh, section, we have discussed the classification of the tweets. And I guess in the next lesson, we'll be going a bit further into particular uh, analysis of sentiment of the tweets. And we'll be talking about uh, regression and classification approaches, where it'll be how we can understand what is the sentiments of people in particular tweets. And based on these sentiments, we can actually make decisions uh, what is the mood of the person and use if a social listening or other applications. So um, we believe that uh, uh, there is an um, explanation in view for the lab soon. So discuss with our race on the app lab one plus two and arrange your completion of the lab individually to submit it to us and for us to listen to the presentation of the lab results, lab one plus two. So come back to research assistant on this. And that's all for today. Um, Yanchi, are you here? Um, could you please join to make sure that we can continue? Uh, yeah, D Dr. Farshif, this is Iman. So uh, if hey, it's Iman, okay, hi. yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm gonna uh, handle the, <laughs> the tutorial part and let's see, I mean, I'm a little sick, but I guess I can, I can do it. It's not a big deal. I just don't know if I need to just pop up the questions and let's see who's gonna get the answers or, you know, I guess that's what I'm gonna do. And- um, that, that, So, okay, so based on what I know is, uh, is uh, Chi is also here. So Chi can- Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so uh, would you like to lead this and then Iman will help you for this uh, first lecture and then after that you guys can just uh, handle or would you like to uh, split questions half-half? What's the, what's the best way for you guys? Uh, uh, I will be the backup of Iman. Yeah. Okay, and so okay. The, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, guys, make sure that you can share the screens.
and uh, please let's try to do this first year our tutorials also in an online mode. I'll be switching off my camera and let's proceed with tutorial in uh, about 10 minutes break from now. All right. <laughs> 